two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. Ha ha, psych, we're not starting there. It's new play day on Shakespeare, and we get to dig into Romeo and Juliet, which I'm sure you know or have heard of, or you've seen a production of it in school, or you had to watch a movie of it in your English class. It, like in high school, this is probably the most read Shakespearean play. And I get it because Romeo and Juliet are teenagers, so maybe they figure it, it translates well and the kids can empathize better or something like that. Or then when they go and mount the stage production of it, they at least have age-appropriate actors to play the two leads. But it could also be because this is a very linear play. You know, you take something like A Midsummer Night's Dream, where you have the royals and the lovers and the fairies and the mechanicals, and there's these different things going on, but then it all gets tied together. All the different storylines get tied together at the end. Romeo and Juliet really only has like one storyline, so maybe they figure that's why this is a good play to start everybody on. But regardless, Romeo and Juliet is where we are starting today, and we are going with the folio that doesn't have that initial prologue in it. That initial prologue is in some of the quarto versions of the play, but it's not in the folio. What's interesting is there is prologue to act two, and I'm saying that in quotes, because also in the folio, Shakespeare didn't lay out any act or scene delineations. He just wrote act one, scene one, and then wrote the play. And I don't know if that's a laziness, if it was intended to just be like French scenes, whatever, but it's for the sake of showing the passage of time throughout the play, I will be referring to scenes as they are delineated in other versions, but we're sticking with the folio text because that's what we've been doing for this whole project all along. So anyway, that that first tidbit and the, the monologue or the, the prologue that we're not actually going to share basically just sets the scene and tells us what's going on in this play. But there's like three other monologues that also do that throughout the course of the play. So we'll just dig right in with Act 1, Scene 1, as it starts in the folio. We start out with Gregory and Samson, who are characters who I believe really only exist in this scene, and they are friends of the House of Capulet, um, which is Juliet's house, and then they're, they're kind of just hanging out, and they're talking smack, and there's lots of sexual innuendo, and they're saying that they're like the toughest guys, and they can beat any, Montague, any Montagues that happen past them, because the Capulets and the Montagues have been fighting with each other forever, like to the point where nobody even really remembers why they're fighting anymore. But since the two houses are fighting, and then all of the people who've allayed themselves with either house are also fighting with the others. So it's it's gang turf war type stuff. We've got the Capulet gang, and we've got the Montague gang. So even though Gregory and Samson may not actually be Capulet family members, they have aligned themselves with the House of Capulet, so they consider all Montagues to be their enemies. So they're talking smack and they're making sexual references about how if they beat up some Montagues, they're going to take and rape the women and all that sort of fun stuff. And then Abram and Balthazar come in, who happen to be aligned with the House of Montague. And there's there's some cute little, like, should we should we engage them? Should we not engage them in a fight? But with Gregory and Samson trying to decide whether or not they should pick a fight with these other two right now as it goes. And they, they waffle back and forth, and some of their tough guyness is sort of squashed down. But Abram and Balthazar are... They're up for it. They're ready for it. So they're like, yeah, we'll start to fight. And then Benvolio comes in, who is a, I believe he's the nephew of Lord Montague. He comes in and he's like, come on, guys. Like, we don't need to be fighting right now. Like, everybody just put down your weapons. But then Tybalt comes in, who is the, I believe, the nephew of Lord Capulet. So now we've, we've gone from like the underlings, the the pawns in the chess game. Now we've bumped up to like the knights because these two, Benvolio and Tybalt, are actually related to the families that they're fighting for. 
uh, Tybalt comes in and he's like, oh, you Montague dog. And Tybalt and Benvolio start fighting. And then there's such a ruckus in the streets that lots of people, other people keep coming out to see what's going on. And Lord and Lady Capulet come out to see what's going on. And Lord and Lady Montague come out to see what's going on. And it turns into this great big hubbub until Prince Aeschylus, who's in charge of Verona, comes out and he says, rebellious subjects, enemies to peace, profaners of this neighbor stained steel. Will they not hear? What ho, you men, you beasts that quench the fire of your pernicious rage with purple fountains issuing from your veins on pain of torture from those bloody hands, throw your mistempered weapons to the ground and hear the sentence of your moved prince. Three civil broils, bred of an airy word by thee, old Capulet and Montague, have thrice disturbed the quiet of our streets and made Verona's ancient citizens cast by their grave beseeming ornaments to wield old partisans in hands as old, cankered with peace to part your cankered hate, if ever you disturb our streets again. Your lives shall pay the forfeit of the peace. For this time, all the rest depart away. You, Capulet, shall go along with me, and Montague, come you this afternoon to know our father's pleasure in this case, to old Freetown, our old common judgment place. Once more, on pain of death, all men depart. So the prince is laying down the law because that's what he's supposed to do. He's the prince. So he comes out and, and yeah, this monologue first, he's just like, everybody stop, throw your weapons to the ground. There's been at least three major brawls in the streets where people have been injured and or killed. And he's like, this is not okay because the Capulet, Mon uh, Capulet Montague fight is spilling over into the citizenry that are not necessarily aligned with the Capulets or the Montagues. He's like, it's, it's getting out of control. It's getting crazy. And this is not okay if I see one more fight between these two sides happening in the streets of Verona, you're both going to be executed. That's, that's how that goes. You know, pain of death to the next person that starts a brawl in the streets of Verona coming from this old argument between the Montagues and the Capulets. So then he takes... Lord and Lady Capulet with him to, you know, it's like, a, it's like a mediator. I'm going to talk to this party and then I'm going to talk to this party. He takes the Capulets with him and then he tells the Montagues to come and visit him later so that he can like lay down the sentence, but they don't have to be in the room at the same time. And then he tells everybody to leave and that's the end of the monologue. And pretty much everybody does leave except, except for the Montagues and Benvolio. And the Montagues want to know from Benvolio what's going on and where's their kid and all sorts of fun stuff like that and we will get further into that tomorrow when we get to hear from benvolio so i will see you then for that Mwah.